Right. Um, hello there today. Um, I'm doing this <coughs> this uh, video um, uh, to support the um, <coughs> A21 topic, module four topic, populations, community, and succession. And it's essentially for any students who are doing uh, tuition with me. Students who are doing tuition with me will already have access to a set of uh, a set of notes and uh, a question booklet and a set of answers and various other bits and pieces. And really, uh, for to, to get benefit from this video, really you need access to these resources because I'd be constantly making reference to the, the notes and the various pages and also making reference to questions and going through some questions. Now, <coughs> suggest there in the title that I might be doing succession as well. Uh, that remains to be seen. It depends. Um, how, how long it takes to get through the initial parts of the topic. Uh, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll try and do succession. But succession almost uh, is uh, such an important topic, well, fairly important topic that it, it might deserve, it might deserve uh, its, own, uh, its own video. <coughs> so I uh, may, do, may do a separate video just for the, for the succession topic. But anyway, um, I don't ha haven't organised planned this too well. Um, we'll just see how it goes. I'm going to work through, work through the the, the topic, and look at uh, appropriate questions as I go. As I say, you need you really need the notes in front of you. The notes in front of you, <coughs> then our notes. Uh, you access the notes and access um, <coughs> to well, to your, I suppose to your own textbook as well to your own notes. Um, it's an easy enough topic this to learn. There's no Essential. There's no real difficulties in it. There's, there's very little um, understanding required. Uh, essentially, it's a it's a it's a learning topic. Uh, starts off there just <coughs> on, the, on the, at the start talking about uh, how the size of a population changes over time. Um, a population being defined as uh, a group of organisms, <coughs> all of the same species, uh, living together in a particular area. So you, population can be referred to a single species. So you're talking about a population of, of dogs, for example, or a population of crows, or whatever. You can't um, can't mix up um, uh, species together to get a population. Population refers just to one species. The term community then is a sort of a collective term for all the all the organisms living in a particular habitat or ecosystem, and essentially in a pot. The term community um, <coughs> encompasses all the various populations. Uh, first page there, looking at how a population increases and decreases over time. Populations change over time, and you can see there, um, it's essentially a simple, a simple little uh, diagram. Uh, questions relative to that would be questions one and question two uh, in the question booklet there, uh, looking at how populations change population size with regards to births, deaths, immigration, and immigration, and so on. Um, okay, <clears throat> moving along quickly then to uh, a major component of this, uh, this topic, is looking at how populations, uh, <clears throat> populations grow and decline, uh, basically graphs that, that show uh, this, how the size of a population would change over time. And essentially you have, you have um, the two types of graphs that you have to be able to Recognize the first one is often referred to as uh, an S shape graph. I'm keeping this. I'm not doing very much on the board here, by the way. Um, essentially, I wouldn't get it all done uh, if I started drawing stuff on the board. Essentially, it's all in, all in the notes booklet here. So I'll just briefly draw some things on the board. So essentially, you have the first curve, first population curve, is sometimes referred to as a S shape curve, and it's essentially it's something <coughs> something like that. It's sort of that shape, so it sort of vaguely looks like an S. So this is population size, and this is time. <coughs> and this is a curve that this this part relates to a very large number of species that you've come across. Can't define exactly which which types of species. It tends to be larger species, larger so-called uh, case-selected species. And we'll come to that term in a moment or two. So the things like humans. Uh, animals, animals in general, plants, large plants in general, show this kind of a population population growth curve. And then you, you're left with uh, different areas of this curve that you have to know about. So region B, 
reach, sorry, reaching A, reaching B, and reaching C. And then the curve may also go like this, so you're reaching D. And these different, uh, these different stages are referred to as the lag phase, <coughs> the log or exponential phase, stable or stationary phase, and then this phase here, the death or decline phase. Now, questions relating uh, to this uh, this graph uh, would be uh, question question nineteen uh, is uh, a good basic question to look at there, and it shows the population growth curve for yeasts. Yeast being grown grown in a flask. Uh, <coughs> essentially, the rest of this question is an experimental question, but the first part of it actually. Uh, talks about how a population of yeasts, yeast or fungi, they be grown in a container, a flask, and grown in water with uh, glucose present, and the yeast would feed on the glucose, and their numbers would increase over time. So you could put in a small number of yeast at the start of the experiment, and then the, watch, you could monitor the yeast population over time. How would you monitor the yeast population over time? You use something called a hemocytometer. Hemocytometer questions, <coughs> hemocytometer calculation questions, I'm not going to look at on this topic. Uh, I'm going to leave them to uh, a video on uh, module six or the experimental, the, the practical, uh, <coughs> practical module, uh, uh, the, uh, sorry, practical module for upper six. So I'll look at the hemocytometer alongside all the other experiment, other experiments for all the different topics in, uh, in upper six. <coughs> but essentially, you, you could be asked then about regions A, B, C, and, and, and D, and ask for the reasons for them. Lag phase, most, <coughs> there are lots of different answers to the lag phase, uh, but the, the best answer is to say that during this phase, population growth doesn't occur. There isn't very much population growth there. Population doesn't grow at all. During this phase, the organism, the best answer is to say the organism is assimilating nutrients. Assimilating nutrients is a way of saying feeding. But then you can't talk about, if you're talking about yeast, it's not right to be sort of talking about the yeast feeding or bacteria feeding. Uh, better to use the term assimilating nutrients. That means taking up food. And then that, <coughs> that term applies to whatever species you're talking about. So you could be talking about lions or bacteria or yeast or elephants or humans or whatever. It's a term assimilating nutrients. Assimilating nutrients, um, and maybe making enzymes, if they're talking about microscopic organisms, you could see them bacteria or virus, bacteria or, bac or yeasts or those sorts of things, might be manufacturing the enzymes to break down the nutrients. And that'll be happening in this phase. We're talking about birds, uh, let's say for example, you can see in this phase here they are mating and uh, laying eggs. And we're talking about mammals, uh, you could say that they are mating uh, and they are pregnant, a uh, period of gestation here, uh, and so on and so forth. So you have to apply it to the organism that you're, you're talking about. Reaching B, a rapid, a rapid area, a area of rapid population growth, often described as log phase or exponential phase. Exponential phase, very rapid population growth. Why such rapid population growth? In this region, well, we're, we're starting from a point where there's not very many organisms present in the habitat or the ecosystem, so there are lots of resources available. There's plenty of salt, plenty of food at this stage, and plenty of other nutrients uh, that the organism might need because the organism's numbers are still quite low at this stage, so you get very rapid, rapid growth. Uh, <coughs> the Sometimes this this rapid growth this rapid growth is described as exponential. And in the past, you've been asked, "What do you understand by the term exponential growth?" And you got away with saying just that exponential growth is very fast population growth. Technically, what exponential growth means is that in any time period, let's say along the bottom we have let's say along the bottom here we have days, then and each subsequent day the population should double the number. That's what exponential means. So every so if on day two you have a thousand organisms, on day three you have two thousand, on day four you have four thousand, on day five you have eight thousand, on day six you have sixteen thousand. That's technically what exponential growth is. So it's very fast growth <coughs> uh, because there are very few organisms at this stage. The kind of competition that's taking place here, well we're going to come to competition in a minute or two, but basically we're just talking this graph just for one species. 
So the competition we're talking about is intraspecific, intra I N T R A, intra specific competition because competition between members of the same species. There's intra specific competition. <clears throat> intra specific competition increases as you move up here. Competition increases because you get a larger number of organisms and less resources available in the in this exponential phase. Now, <clears throat> uh, there's, there's a number of terms that are important in this topic. The term, exp sorry, the term exponential growth I've kind of explained. Term biotic potential is often used. And you might say that in this region here, initially the organism is growing at its biotic. The population of the organism is growing at its biotic potential. And basically, biotic potential definition is the maximum rate of population growth that an organism or a species is capable of under ideal conditions. Ideal conditions might be ideal temperature, ideal water supply, ideal nutrient supply, and so on. So biotic potential. So initially the organism is growing its biotic potential, but eventually the organism stops growing its biotic potential because you have what you would refer to as environmental resistance. And environmental resistance is a collective term that refers to all of the factors that are going to slow down the population growth. So you're talking basically about essentially competition for food, competition for space, uh, <coughs> etc. Possibly even build up of waste products and so on. So environmental resistance is another term that you <coughs> have to be aware of. And I think I've defined it, environmental resistance here. I'm just looking for it. Where it's been defined, I've just said how environmental factors rest restrict the population from growing at its biotic potential. Eventually, the organism, <coughs> the population of the organism rises to a level here, it levels off, and that's called the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity of, for any, any species in any particular environment is <coughs> the maximum number uh, and the pop maximum population number that that, uh, that particular environment can support of that particular species. Carrying capacity of, the, of a particular area could change over time if there's more or less food. In fact, it's often inaccurate to, to draw the in this line here. I, I prefer this line to sort of draw like this. So it's it's not it's not a permanently flat line. Um, over a period of time, over maybe even this is years, you would find that the population would fluctuate around the carrying capacity. So once the organism reaches the carrying capacity, up in this region here in the carrying up in, <coughs> up in this region, which is be called the the um, stationary stable zone. Now birth rate and death rate would be balanced, equally balanced, so the, <clears throat> the number of organisms uh, being born be equal to the number of organisms dying off, so the population remains constant. In this region here, <clears throat> you'd have birth rate would be greater than death rate. More organisms, more new organisms would be joining the population and would be, would be dying off. <clears throat> Carrying capacity then. And you may be asked to um, measure that from a graph as you do there in question 19. So question 19 asks you about the lag phase, give, give reasons, a couple of reasons why you give the lag phase. Uh, the reasons here I see for the lag phase is uh, organisms <coughs> being, um, organisms reproducing and time taken for nutrient assimilation. Then <coughs> we come on eventually to the, the decline phase and the decline phase doesn't necessarily have to happen but with many organisms, you see that after a period of time, uh, the population may fall off, and you get asked then uh, reasons why the population might decline. It's in this region here in the decline phase, often called the death phase. Uh, the, rate, <coughs> the birth rate is less than the death rate. In other words, death rate greater than birth rate. Organisms are dying off more quickly than they've been born, causing the population to decline. Reasons from over here <coughs> um, food has run out, shortage of food, disease has developed. Uh, a predator is present, or, um, for example, build up of waste products in the environment. An organism in any in, in the environment, waste products might build up or put, uh, um, destroy the environment or damage the environment. So <coughs> that's um, that's the uh, <coughs> the so-called sigmoid or S-shaped growth curve, um, and you need to know that, as I say, the definitions you need to know would be population, community. A biotic potential, environmental resistance, carrying capacity, um, <coughs> intraspecific competition, and so on and so forth. <coughs> now, the other kind of curve that comes up uh, and gets asked about sometimes is, is a so-called J-shaped curve. 
Now, how do I represent the G shape curve when I think about it? Well, my sort of simplistic way of thinking about a G shape curve is that a G shape curve is essentially an S shape curve without the stable phase, without the station phase. In other words, in G shape growth, the organism, and usually the population growth is even quicker in a G shape curve. The population grows up very quickly and it, it climbs up incredibly quickly. But instead of achieving a stationary phase where it levels off, the population <coughs> suddenly dives back down again. And this is referred to as J-shaped growth. And I think that bit of it there sort of looks like a J-shaped J growth. <coughs> and what you may find is uh, over a period of time, you may get this happening repeatedly. So the population may shoot away up and then uh, fall back. And this kind, of, this kind of growth is often called boom and bust growth. Boom and bust population growth. And it might be a seasonal thing. Seasonal thing, I might mean by it might happen. You might have like uh, the, the growth of the population in the summer followed by a decline in the autumn and winter. But the next summer, you get an increase in the population and a decline again. And this happens <coughs> typically uh, with, um, with <coughs> so called R selected organisms. And we'll say a bit more about R selected in a month or two. But <coughs> the only examples that have ever been asked about this. Uh, and uh, I'll direct you there to question three. The only, only question I've ever been asked about this is in relation to uh, an algal bloom. Algal bloom, you remember algal bloom from uh, GCSE where a fertilizer got in the river uh, from the farmland and fertilizer causes the number of algae, the algae population to shoot upwards. To increase, that's what algal bloom simply meant. The, the algal population <coughs> uh, shot up. Um, and you see there in question three, they, they ask you actually to draw a J-shaped curve. Essentially, you should draw an appropriate curve for an algal population and a pond from April to December. April to December, well, April, start of the spring, you get the population going up like this. And then quickly coming back down again. So basically, they were looking for uh, that, kind of, that kind of curve. Um, and they said it uh, related to uh, an algal population. And that's the, only that's the only population that I've ever seen this J-shaped curve um, asked in respect of. And <coughs> they they, I remember a question a few years back where they said, discuss uh, this boom and bust curve. <coughs> boom. This is the boom bit here. The boom, O, O, M, and then the drop, the sudden drop is called bust. And these are sort of terms that are used, boom and bust. <coughs> the boom, uh, for example, in the algae, what happened, or the booming population happened in the spring and summer. And the argument was that in the spring and summer, in the spring, <coughs> we're talking about algae growing in a river or a pond or a lake or something like that. See, in the spring and summer, there's more fertilizer applied to the land, and then you get more fertilizer running off, nit nitrates running into the river. So you get a source of nitrates. You also get higher temperatures as the spring and summer approaches and higher light levels, and those three would contribute to the fast growth of the algae. Algae are essentially microscopic, microscopic plant cells, single cell, <coughs> single cell plant cells. Going back to AS, uh, synoptic, a synoptic question might ask you what, uh, what kingdom they belong to. <coughs> uh, algae, if you remember, belong to the Protoctista, Protoctista kingdom. So in the spring and summer, <coughs> you get uh, higher nutrient levels in the water, more nitrates get into the water. Um, you get higher temperatures, you get you get higher light levels, and all that contributes to the, the boom <coughs> and population growth of the algae. And then in the winter, as you proceed into the winter, um, then you get less. There's less and less nitrates available in the water due to less agricultural activity. Uh, nitrates are being used up. It's also getting colder, and the light levels are decreasing, and that might contribute then to a sudden <coughs> sudden drop in the in the population of the algae. So <clears throat> that's that's the kind of question you ask about the j shape growth. Now <clears throat> uh, I've included then immediately after this, after the looking at this S shaped and J shaped curves, I immediately started talking about R and K selected species. Now these are sort of like general groupings that organisms are put into according to uh, <clears throat> their population growth curves. And essentially Essentially, uh, our selected species are organisms that show a sort of boom and bust type growth. They have a J-shaped curve, our selected species, whereas K-selected species are those that show 
and, and a sigmoid shaped curve. In other words, they get the normal increase in population and then they stable, tend to stabilize off at the, at the stationary phase, RNK selected species. <clears throat> now, you might ask, who are these RNK selected? Who, who's who? Well, essentially, you, you tend to get questions that ask you about the nature of RNK selected species. And, and in simple terms, uh, R-selected species with J-shaped population growth tend to be smaller organisms, tend to be small. Things like a bacteria and fungi and yeast <coughs> and smaller, smaller plants, uh, lichens and very small grasses and plants <coughs> are selected species. What do they show? They tend to be small body size. They tend to be very fast reproducers. They can, the population shoots away up very quickly. The population can rocket very quickly. And they <coughs> tend to produce a lot of offspring lots of offspring, lots of young. So typically in, list in my notes that I'm saying things like bacteria and I've said weeds, I'm not too happy with the word weeds. <clears throat> I'm essentially talking about small plants and they're usually small, high rates of reproduction, many offspring, fast migration and dispersal. Uh, so <clears throat> our selected species are those that can move around quickly so they can be in one place, grow very quickly, diminish and move on to move on to a new area, very fast migrating and dispersal. High, high birth rates, high death rates, <coughs> and good at immigration and immigration. Uh, whereas case selected species tend to be larger, uh, larger animals and plants and humans and birds and the like, usually large, uh, slower rate of reproduction. So don't, <coughs> sorry, slower rate of reproduction, essentially slower population growth, uh, fewer offspring produced, uh, <coughs> slow migration and dispersal. So they're not good at migrating and dispersal. Uh, low birth rates, low death rates, low immigration, low immigration. <clears throat> so, uh, J selected species tend to come into habitat, grow very quickly uh, whenever there's plenty of resources and little competition, but are um, quickly, uh, <clears throat> quickly outcompeted and can disappear from that population again. Whereas, K selected species uh, <clears throat> are those that can establish slowly in a, in a habitat and reach a steady levels or steady numbers and tend to stay there for a long period of time. Now when we come, to, we come later to succession we'll be saying that pioneer species, those that first uh, uh, colonize a new habitat tend to be our selected species. We're talking about bacteria, <coughs> small plants, algae, uh, yeasts, <coughs> mosses, lichens, those sorts of things. First colonize a new habitat but they're eventually displaced uh, whereas the climax species, which is essentially trees and larger plants and bushes and so on, they have a, a R -shape, uh, S shaped curve. They tend to grow very slowly, increase in population slowly, but they become established and uh, stay there permanently. They have a, uh, they have a stationary phase where the, the number, their number stay steady. So and that's relating you to. Uh, are in case selected species, um, just saying once again, question three, uh, question two and question three are, are, are bits there that are in case selected species. Moving on then to <coughs> the next thing, with population interactions. Population inter interactions <coughs> are, uh, are competition, predation, uh, parasitism and mutualism. Interactions. Here we're talking about how different populations <coughs> interact with each other, how two populations interact with each other um, in, in an environment. Two or more populations interact with each other. <coughs> you have this idea uh, of a plus minus interaction or a plus plus interaction. A plus minus interaction is the idea that, that one of the species um, wins out and the other is outcompeted. Or loses out on the sorry loses out on the interaction. Plus plus is an unusual one where both species benefit from the interaction, and so on and so forth. So we're going to look at the, these interactions. Uh, most appropriate question here is question question twenty, which is a question which is an essay question, uh, very recent essay question in like two thousand eighteen. Essay question that asks you about all four interactions. Um, very good question. Also, um, just looking at your questions, uh, questions four and question five are older style questions asking about uh, competition, prediction, and so on and so forth. Now, this is relatively straightforward stuff. I'm not going to go through 
<clears throat> this in any great detail um, because it's it's really about uh, you learning the stuff yourself and you need notes and get to your own notes and uh, learn off the <clears throat> learn off the graphs and the, and the curves and so on for these situations. Uh, maybe just touch on one or two things. Touch on one or two things here. Uh, with respect to the first one we're going to talk about is competition. Competition then you'd have to understand the terms intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. Intraspecific competition we already talked about. That's with competition between members of the same species uh, in, a, in a particular environment and that's to do with population growth. Essentially in this talk, this part population interactions we're talking about different populations interacting with each other. So we're talking about entire specific competition, competition between members of different species. So to give you a simple example, if you had, for example, <coughs> uh, if you had rabbits and hares living on, an, on, on, a, on a mountain area, then th there's two different species and they'd be competing with each other for all sorts of things, it's probably essentially food and space and so on. So intra and entire specific competition. <clears throat> now, typically, when you have two spe two different species uh, living together and competing for the same resource, often you get often you get one of the species wanting out, and the other spe species sorry one of the species wanting the competition and other one dying out, and that's referred to as competitive exclusion. Co competitive exclusion is when two species competing for the same resource, one of the species uh, one's out in the competition, and the other is uh, as it were. Is the <coughs> is dispersed from that particular area or, or is removed from that area due to the competition or they can't survive in that particular area. I suppose the classic example of that would be the red squirrel and the grey squirrel, uh, which tend to share the same sorts of habitats. Uh, <coughs> but what we see is generally that the grey squirrel seems to outcompete the red squirrel for habitat and space. And that's an example of competitive exclusion. And <clears throat> any questions about this, usually with the term, you'd have to talk about the term competitive exclusion. And I refer you then uh, to the essay question there. Uh, <coughs> that's the essay question 20. And you can see there a uh, graph A uh, shows you two species. In this case, it's two, two plant species going together. And uh, equally, plant, one plant species can now compete the other plant species. Uh, they would be competing for light and water and nutrients in the soil and so on. One species might comp out compete the other. Um, okay, so that's the first one. Um, competition, uh, predation, well, predator prey relationship. Uh, the predators eating the prey <coughs> or consuming the prey. And what you get is you tend to get a cyclic, you get a, you get a sort of a, a, a graph that gets a this is time along the bottom. And this is population population size. And if we do the if we do the uh, prey species first of all, so let's say the prey species their number increases like that, then what you tend to find is that the predator predator numbers will will increase as well. And so predator numbers will start to increase as well. Um, predator numbers will like that. At some point or other. And with the predator numbers increase, then that puts pressure on the prey, uh, and uh, their, their, their numbers then sort of level off, and then they might start to decline. And they would level off and decline because the, the, prey, the prey are eating them, essentially. And the thing I notice here, <coughs> and very important in these graphs, is that the point at which the, the prey species reaches its max number there is before. <coughs> The predator numbers reach their max. In other words, the predator curve is said to lag behind the, the prey curve. So, so as the prey numbers come down, then the predator numbers also come down, and then you get the you get the you get the, the prey numbers come back up again. So if I just do a wee bit more here, you can see the predator numbers then decline. <coughs> the graph keep declining, <coughs> and then the, the and the prey numbers go up then, predator numbers can go up. And once again, notice <coughs> that the, the prey numbers maximize there, and then the predator numbers they maximize shortly afterwards. In other words, I keep it, and any answers to any of these questions, I have to say that the, <coughs> the, pre the predator population lags behind the prey population in terms of the curve. 
pre <coughs> predator population like that. The only thing to notice there is, and if you're asked to say which of the two cars you the two cars weren't labelled, then <coughs> you, you tend to find that a that the uh, the smaller number of predators, so the predator population will generally be smaller. In fact, I'm, I'm struggling to give an example where the predator numbers are larger than the prey numbers. And pre numbers of pre predators tend to be numbers of prey. So if you consider, for example, lions hunting uh, zebra or wildebeest in the African plains, then you have a very big herd of the zebra and, uh, and so on, and a relatively small herd of lions. So the, the numbers of the predator will tend to be smaller and their population peaks <coughs> will lag behind that of the of the prey species. Uh, on then to parasitism. Parasitism is another example of a plus minus relationship where the parasite benefits and the prey <coughs> loses out or not the prey, the uh, host is the correct word for parasite uh, host relationship. So the host is the organism which the parasites live. Um, parasites you mightn't be that familiar with. I think everybody's familiar with dogs and cats having worms inside them, and that would be a, a common parasite uh, that you may be familiar with. And you understand, and you need a definition of a parasite. So, parasitic relationship is where the parasite lives in or on the host, uh, harming the host in some way, or they're stopping the host growing properly and stopping the population of the host growing. The host growing properly, but not killing the host, uh, living in or on the host and benefiting from living on the host, but not not killing the host. Uh, it would be the disadvantage of the parasite to actually kill the host, because when the host dies, then the parasite is going to die as well. So <clears throat> questions once again refer you to uh, <clears throat> the essay question question twenty on that. Um, on then to mutualism, mutualism. <coughs> uh, it used to be also called a uh, symbiotic relationship or some symbiosis. Mutualism, as the name suggests, a relationship and where mutual, where both organisms benefit from the relationship. And there are a few examples that you do come across. The classic examples you come across is this idea of <clears throat> bacteria living inside the stomachs of inside the, the stomachs of uh, animals such as cows and sheep herbivores, where the bacteria in some way or other help the animal to digest its food. And that's an example of a, some, of a symbiotic or mutualistic relationship. Both, for example, a cow and the bacteria in her stomach, the cow benefits because the bacteria help to digest the very difficult to digest food that the cow eats, the, the grass, and then the bacteria will digest some of the cellulose. <coughs> and uh, that, the, the benefits of that and the products of cellulose digestion will be the glucose molecules, those molecules, some of those molecules then will be available to the cow. Uh, so the cow benefits in that sense. And how do the bacteria benefit? Will the bacteria get to live inside the cow's gut in a nice environment where their numbers can increase and they can benefit from uh, the food supply being get brought to them uh, by the cow. So cow and our bacteria, so it's, to an extent it also applies to some uh, mutualistic relationships in our cells. We're told that we have got bacteria that that uh, we should cultivate to some extent, but since we benefit from the fact that these bacteria can produce certain uh, vitamins or break down certain foods for us, and so benefit. The other classic example is, um, which is a crossover with uh, the <coughs> nitrogen cycle topic, is um, where certain plants called legumes, peas, beans, and clover plants tend to have this uh, mutualistic relationship. With a group of bacteria that live inside their roots in so-called nodules. So inside the roots of these plants, these bacteria uh, live in the roots, <coughs> and uh, it's a mutualistic relationship to the ship to the extent that the the <coughs> bacteria can uh, convert atmospheric nitrogen from soil air spaces into ammonia, eventually into nitrates, and those nitrates can be available to the plant. To make its amino acids and make its proteins. So that's how the plant benefits. How do those bacteria benefit from living inside the roots of the, the plant? Well, some of the glucose that's produced by the plant in photosynthesis is, can be brought in, makes its way down into the root system and is available to the bacteria. So both benefit from uh, the, the, this, this, this relationship where they're you know, living together. Another example is one that's not on the specific, not usually mentioned in the specification, 
and there's another textbook out there, are a species called lichen, or not a species, I shouldn't say they're a species, lichens, <coughs> you come across lichens as an indicator species, uh, you come across them as the first, uh, as an indicator organ, indicator organism, you come across them in, with respect to um, succession, where they tend to be the uh, first organisms that might make their way to a new habitat and colonize a new habitat. Actually, <coughs> lichens um, are <coughs> uh, two organisms going together. You have an algae and a fungus living in close proximity, and they're kind of wove together into the one into the one entity, uh, into the lichen. Uh, the algae, um, being plants, can be photosynthesis and provide um, food, uh, whereas the uh, the fungus is able to uh, provide uh, purchase or stability for the lichen and allow it to cling tightly to a surface and to gain uh, a certain amount of moisture from the surface. So both contribute to the, the in this, in this relationship. Uh, by the way, lichens are not mentioned in the specification anywhere. It's just that uh, they do come up, you do come across them in the succession topic and I just thought it was only appropriate that we would mention them as a mutualistic a lichen being a mutualistic arrangement where two organisms benefit from being together. Um, as I say, other there are other questions there on those different relationships. This has been asked in, in an essay in 2018, uh, so you can have a look at that essay. It's, it's essay question number 20. <coughs> on to the next thing, there's controlling pest populations. Um, we did a wee bit of this at AS, uh, this is basically um, pest populations, of, and this is in relation to uh, growing, farming and growing, where you have <coughs> growing crops, uh, for example wheat or potatoes or barley or some other crop, and you've got a pest species that is living in or on the crop. A pest being any organism that causes economic disadvantage to the farmer or grower. They're, so their <coughs> pest would be maybe eating the crop or feeding on the eating the animals and biting the animals, living inside the animals, causing the animals not farmers' animals not to grow as well. Or pests. Pests can also be what's referred to weeds. And weeds would be any plant that's growing where it shouldn't be, as it were, and causing economic uh, <coughs> damage to the, the growth of the crop. Uh, <coughs> essentially, uh, what we're looking at here in this topic is been able to control a pest population by means of using pesticides. <coughs> pesticide being any chemical that's used to kill a pest, different types of pesticides. So within the group, <coughs> the group, within the sort of, within the, 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 <coughs> the class or group of pesticides, of all pesticides, there's really only two that you need to know, two different kinds of pests, two types of pesticides. Uh, insecticides, so you have Insecticide, I N S E C T I C A D E S. Insecticides would be pesticide chemical that's used to kill insects. And the only other one that you come across is herbicide. And basically, herbicide is weed killer. So herbicides would be chemicals used to kill plants that you don't want growing in the crop. So pesticide is the general name for these chemicals, and then you have specific ones, insecticides. Herbicides, what other ones you have? Rodenticides kill rats, uh, <coughs> aphidicides kill aphids, and so on. So you just uh, they end up in CID. <coughs> but, uh, so <coughs> this is looking at how you control pests. And you use pesticide, basically a, <coughs> a, a chemical, pesticide being chemicals that kill the pest. <coughs> and uh, you get quite a bit of comparison in this topic between using chemicals to control a pest numbers and using other methods, other more environmentally friendly methods. These pesticides are chemicals. They get into the, into the environment and they are, <coughs> they are not as it were, environmentally friendly because these chemicals are often toxic to uh, ourselves, possibly even if we're eating the food that the, the chemical has been sprayed onto. Let's say you, the farmer sprays his field of wheat to kill some insect pest that's uh, eating the wheat. Uh, that pesticide that uh, so-called insecticide might still be on the wheat whenever the wheat is being ground up to make bread, for example. So we have to consider that. <coughs> uh, or if you're using a herbicide to kill weeds in a crop, that herbicide uh, may be present on the crop itself when the crop comes to be harvested and may make its way 
into human food into the food chain. So we have to consider that <coughs> regarding the use of chemicals to control pests is now regarded as somewhat <coughs> um, uh, dangerous and somewhat an environmentally unfriendly. So we're <coughs> looking at modern techniques, modern ways of dealing with pests without using chemicals. Just looking there, first of all, on page 13, chemical pest control and discussing advantages and disadvantages there. Chemical pest control <coughs> can be, is often broad spectrum. Broad spectrum simply means that the chemical you're using to kill the pest, should the, say the pest is an insect and you're using an insecticide, often the chemical that the farmer, farmer or grower uses is broad spectrum. That means it kills all insects in that particular environment. So not only does it kill the pest insect, but it may kill bird, <coughs> bees and wasps and butterflies and moths and lots of other insect species that are um, maybe advantageous and certainly not doing any damage to the crop. So broad spectrum insect to say <coughs> well, you, you want, if you're going to use a, a chemical that you, you're going to use, a, you better use a narrow spectrum or specific uh, chemical, specific pesticide to kill a specific species. <coughs> uh, pest species also develop resistance over a period of time to the chemical, since that the chemical doesn't work anymore. Apparently about 40, 40 or 50 percent of rats, all rats now, are resistant to the normal <coughs> rat poison that used to be used, um, used to be used to kill rats. And the same applies to lots of other species. They develop resistance. <coughs> um, but something else that happens, and you often get questions on this, is, <coughs> and I'll just relate you to, relate you to uh, question six in the question booklet there, and the graph for part C. <coughs> and um, I've got a similar sort of graph in the notes, this idea of pest resurgence. And here's the, here's the basic idea of it. <coughs> um, farmer has got a crop, uh, let's say wheat, and he observes that a pest is present. <coughs> Some pest insect is eating wheat. And uh, <coughs> he decides, he or she decides they're going to spray the crop with a, uh, an insecticide to kill the pest insect. Uh, when they do so, <coughs> what they initially observe is that the number of the pests initially, after the chemical is applied, the number of the pests will decline. And the farmer thinks, well, that's good. We've killed, the, we're starting to kill the pest off. The pest numbers will decline. Only <coughs> for Shortly after that, a short period later, the pest numbers return again to their original levels and not only return to their original levels but go to higher levels than they were originally. So it, it would appear that using the insecticide to kill the pest has been counterproductive. It only killed it for a short period of time and its numbers have eventually shot up again. Now, <clears throat> just looking here, there are questions relating to this, questions 10, 11, 12 and 13 in the question book that's here, so you can make reference to all those questions. Now, why should this be? By the way, this can be when the, the pest numbers go down initially and then suddenly they surge back up again above what they were originally. This is referred to as pest resurgence. This sudden resurge in numbers of the pest in the crop is called pest resurgence. Explanation for it? Well, the explanation is this. The explanation is that when the farmer was observing the field with this pest insect eating his crop, he was not aware that there was already present in the crop a predatory species, possibly another um, insect <coughs> that was eating the pest and keeping the pest numbers at relatively mediocre levels. <coughs> there was also a predatory insect pest. But whenever the farmer sprayed the crop, that killed both the pest, so the pest numbers went down, but it also killed the predator. And the predator numbers went away down. As soon as the predator numbers went down, the predator, the predator species was no longer controlling the population of the pest and <coughs> pest numbers could suddenly come back up again. And not only did they come back up, but they would come up higher than they were before because the predator had been removed. <coughs> now, um, you might say, how, how, did, how does the pest recover if you spray the crop? Doesn't the spray kill all the pests? We often get asked that question. Why, did, why might the number of pests not go down to zero? Answer is possibly some of the pests are resistant to the spray, to the chemical. Some of the pest species are resistant. The spray doesn't reach them all because they might be on their leaves or behind twigs or underneath the crop. So the, pet, the chemical doesn't reach them all. 
Uh, they may exist in some form that's resistant to the chemical. They may exist in an egg form or wrapped up in a little wrapper and protected from the chemical. But those are all reasons why the, the pest can resurge again and those numbers can shoot, shoot back up. So <clears throat> uh, there are many reasons then. Well, the other, another reason for <coughs> pesticides, not using pesticides, they're very expensive. So there's several reasons there. You can check them all out. Why you're using, pe using pesticides is sort of shunned nowadays. You, know, you have to, may have to make several applications of the pesticide and they're very expensive. One application may not reduce the pest for the whole season, for the whole period of time when the crop is growing. You may have several different applications and that all costs money. So alternative, uh, more environmentally approach might be to introduce into your crop <coughs> a predatory species. If one isn't already present, a predatory species that will eat the pest for you. Uh, and this, this, is, this is referred to as biological control. Biological control is where you use some um, <coughs> uh, organism to destroy the species such as a predator or a pathogen or some other organism that would uh, feed, <coughs> feed on the pest. And uh, an example that's often given uh, is ladybirds. Ladybirds are small beetles which consume about 20 aphids per day. Aphid is the pest species. Aphids are common on many crops. Aphids are insects, very tiny insects that suck the juices out of plants, suck the juices out of your plants. They actually they suck the juice out of the flown vessels in the plant and you may have thousands of these aphids on one individual plant and that basically causes the plant to die or loses all its, its, all its um, juice, it loses all its uh, sugars made in photosynthesis. <coughs> Typical ladybird, and the ladybird is referred to as the, the predatory species or the, the control organisms that are. Ladybird can eat 20, possibly these aphids every day, so the ladybird can keep the numbers of the aphids down. Uh, and then there's often quite an emphasis then on how you, the aspects of the biological control of organisms. So if you're introducing ladybirds into a crop as a control species, there are a number of considerations you have to make. And, you, and these are often asked as in question, uh, just refer you then to which question is again. Uh, yeah, question six, I think. There, that was asked that recently. Basically says, and give reasons why it's necessary to carry out detailed research before releasing a biological control agent into a habitat. In other words, you need to look into the details of your of your control organism species. <coughs> you have to check them out. So the control organism, I'm just running through the list here, control organism should should be able should should be able to survive in that particular habitat or environment and reproduce in sufficient numbers to maintain itself. They should reduce the number of the pest species quickly. There's no point in the predatory organism <clears throat> slowly getting rid of the pest. You need to get rid of the pest quickly. The average growing season for a crop would be from, say, spring to autumn, so maybe about four months. So the predator, if you introduce a predator in the spring into the, species, into the crop, it needs to really eat the pest quickly and get rid of it. <clears throat> you should, the, predator, the species you introduce shouldn't prey on other local organisms. It shouldn't attack other organisms in the locality that may be part of the food chain, may be food for some other organism. Shouldn't disrupt local food chains is a way of saying that. <coughs> uh, the predatory species, the species you introduce shouldn't outcompete other local species for food and that would disrupt food chains as well. <coughs> and uh, also you need to check that there isn't a predator present in the, in the area of the crop that might uh, Eat, the, eat your predator species, it might be a bird, <coughs> maybe your, the species you introduce then just gets decimated because a local, maybe a local predator, maybe local birds maybe may go for it uh, and remove it and then it's not out. So, so, and also, <coughs> the general idea is you, you, you should only have to introduce your predator species once into the area. You shouldn't have to constantly keep, as it were, reapplying it. You shouldn't have to constantly reproduce, put, put new numbers in there. Put more of that same species in there. <clears throat> because uh, that would be kind of productive, that would become, start becoming expensive as well. So <clears throat> there you are, um, so you then, <clears throat> then you sort of finish this topic by sort of discussing the advantages and disadvantages of biological control as compared to chemical control, chemical control of pesticides. And it's all pretty obvious uh, <clears throat> that you basically you're trying to get rid of and negate all the negative aspects of uh, using chemicals to control pests. 
and I think you're basically getting rid of all of those, hopefully, by using a biological control organism. So you could say there's less disruption of the environment or food webs or biodiversity because you're not spraying chemicals and destroying organisms. Biological controls should target only the pest species and not other local species. There's no possibility of resistance developing among the pest species to a biological control organism. And there's no possibility of, uh, shouldn't be possibility of sudden surges in pest numbers, pest resurgence as you would get with pesticides. And overall, the cost should be much lower. The overall cost of, of uh, growing that crop should be lower because instead of possibly making five applications of chemical per season, which is very expensive, you can maybe just apply, just introduce a predatory species at the start of the season and that will control the population of the pest year after year. So <coughs> major cost benefits to the grower and also a big benefit to the environment and that you're not putting nasty chemicals into the environment. Now, <coughs> uh, I'm going to stop there. I said at the start, I was hoping we might do succession as well, <coughs> but um, I'm going to leave that for <coughs> a, uh, a, separate, a separate video um, and do a separate video on succession. Now, <coughs> there are, if you have my question, Victor, as you should have, there are lots of good questions there to do. And really, I have to, <coughs> have to uh, try to convince you all the time that the most important thing is to do, do past favorite questions. Because it's only in doing past favorite questions that you can, you will improve. Understanding the topic is grand. Uh, everybody can eventually understand, especially these topics if you're relevant to. But it's only in doing past favorite questions that you, you see some of the nuances that come into questions and the, <coughs> the aspects that examiners tend to like to ask. And uh, <coughs> they, they can be off-putting if you haven't rehearsed the, rehearsed the questions and got used to the types of questions. So as I, I referred to you all the questions as we went along there for the different topics, um, <coughs> different different areas this talk. And uh, as I say, uh, I'll do a separate video then on succession and uh, pop on <coughs> yeah, succession. Okay, thank you very much then. Uh, all the best. <coughs>